And now, ladies and gentlemen, Don't Tell Mama is proud to present... Wait a minute. Is it Alan Tulin or Al Tulane? <laughs> As a kid, I loved singing show tunes and frolicking naked. My hair was black. I entered grade seven at four foot eleven, determined not to look back. And as I matured, I had the impression each childhood obsession would lead somewhere. I'm still singing show tunes and frolicking naked, but now with silver white hair. And in the meantime, meantime, all they gave me is that in between time for my loving and my living. I gotta do it in the time I'm given. Meantime, don't mean nothing to posterity. But in the meantime, doing nothing sure is a worry in me. When I was a kid, I loved to play dress up, to paint pretty pictures, to cook and sew. Before there were Muppets, I made my own puppets and earned five dollars a show. My little face beaming, the dreams I was dreaming were sure to propel me to soaring heights. Now almost retired, say, What is required to see my name up in lights? And in the meantime, meantime, what I'm left with is this in between time. But I'll do it and get to it, 'cause my friends are gonna see me through it. Meantime, don't mean nothing. To posterity, but in the meantime, doing nothing sure is a worrying. The way the times are hurrying, meantime, sure is a worrying me. Thank you. So much. Please sit down. <laughs> But thank you for being here and welcome, and thank you for coming to my life. I'm so glad I could make it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Christopher Howard on the piano. <laughs> I have to get something off my chest right away. I need to assure you, I'm not worried. I do want to leave my phone on though because I'm expecting a call from my shrink. <laughs> That's a lie. I don't have a phone. <laughs> But since, well, Cabaret, hi Lisa. <laughs> cabaret has kind of morphed into therapy with a two drink minimum. What, what better place to talk about all of the stuff that's just too personal to discuss with my therapist? Anyway, I'm, I'm so happy to be here and have so many dear friends from so many years here with me. I, I have to tell you a little something. I have my own personal musical history right in this very space. Yeah, I do. It was 1977, and I appeared in the very first singer's showcase ever. In fact, the two drink minimum hadn't even been invented. And I was here, I don't know what I performed. 
I only know that I sang here 38 years ago, and I've always heard if they like you, they have you back right away. So, <laughs> here I am. But to tell my story, I need to go back even farther than that. It's to the time when I was about seven years old, and it's to New Jersey. We're gonna go to Jersey. We're gonna go to Milburn to the Paper Mill Playhouse because it was a production of The Music Man starring the incomparable Robert Preston, and I saw it. And it was unbelievable. And that moment, right before 76 trombones, he pulls off his sport coat, he flips it inside out, he puts it back on, and he turns into the leader of a marching band. And it was amazing to me. And I, I kind of knew in that instant that I had to do that, and I had to be that. And I was determined to get myself from that dark spot in the balcony into that spotlight down stage center. On the other side of the tracks, that is where I'm going to be. On the other side of that great divide between fame and fortune and me. Gonna put my shadows behind me, keep my inhibitions the axe. And tomorrow morning you'll find me on the other side of the tracks On the other side of that line Where the life is fancy and free Gonna sit and fan on a fat divan While the butler buttles the tea But for now I'm facing the fences And I can't afford to relax Cause the whole caboodle commences On the other side of the tracks so I'm off and running over the rail. I'm going gunning after the quail. Off and running, send me the mail to that great big world on the other side. The great big world on the farther side. The great big world on the other side of the tracks. To that great big world that'll open wide. To that great big world on the other side of the tracks. Thank you. This is Max, ladies and gentlemen, by the way. And I think Randy is also taking care of you. Make sure you get that second drink. That's, that's, that's really wonderful. <laughs> Things improve steadily as you, as, you, as you continue to drink. Actually, it's not a bad idea. There should be some water here for me. Is it back there? Okay, so that brings us to the phone call I'm expecting. And you see, I'm, I'm always expecting it. Because somewhere in this great big world of ours, there's a production of Music Man that's gonna open tomorrow night. And there's a Harold Hill who's gonna get Tomaine poisoning. And I'm ready. Now, the other intense childhood experience also has its roots at the Paper Mill Playhouse, and it was the following year, a production of Camelot, and therefore, my first exposure to men wearing tights. <laughs> it was almost as exciting as 76 trombones. <laughs> when Stuart Damon, hey Scott, Stuart Damon was playing Sir Lancelot, and he made his entrance downstage right in a pair of powder blue, powder blue tights. And this little eight-year-old Alan was, was suddenly filled with that, that tingly sensation that signals either intense excitement or food poisoning. And in my case, it was nothing I ate. Well, as soon as we got home, I ran right upstairs. I did the most logical thing. I drew a picture. Not a Stuart Damon. I drew a picture of the Camelot Castle because the castle was incredible. It was three-dimensional and it, it spun around to, to depict different locations in the palace. And I worked on it for a long time and it had three turrets and a couple of flags and a winding staircase that came around. And I brought it down to show my father who was sitting at the dining room table. And I said, hey, this is my picture. It's the Camelot Castle. I did my own version. And I even wrote down the special colors that I chose. And um, he took a look at it. And in this, this funny voice that he used to do, he says, 
turquoise, silver, powder blue, well, kiss you. And I walked out of the dining room and into the kitchen and I walked out the back door and I sat down on a cold gray milk box. Autumn, it feels like autumn. Although the breeze is still, I feel the chill of autumn. Oh yes, it's autumn. It's always autumn. However green the hill to me, it still is autumn. I can feel the frost now that makes my spring and summer dreams seem lost now. Why can't the autumn haze recall the days of warm summer laughter that faded soon after in autumn? He left in autumn. And though another season's here, I feel the emptiness of autumn all the year. Why can't the autumn haze recall the days of warm summer laughter that faded soon after? In autumn, he left in autumn. And though another season's here, I feel the emptiness of autumn all the year. Autumn. Autumn. So, the Paper Mill Playhouse introduced me to two of my passions, and it was during my sophomore year of high school that I discovered a third. <laughs> Clink a glass and wipe your eye for my bygone days at West Orange High. <laughs> And the class I learned to dread, the ego buster they called Fizz Ed. Basketball, baseball, football, stickball, volleyball, dodgeball, tetherball, kickball. Playing was hell, but worst of all was the ritual that came first of all. one picked, non-athletic, last one picked, at sports I was pathetic, other kids could tumble and run, but my coordination was totally un. Six guys left, stomach sinking, three guys left, my self-esteem was shrinking, felt so ashamed I could have cried, nobody wanted me on their side. How many notes did I forge to say? Please excuse Alan from Jim today. He wrenched his back, his colon spastic. He's got meningitis and his kneecaps are plastic. I was the last one picked, rejected by the rabble. Last one picked, I could beat them all at Scrabble. My brains didn't do me a bit of good. The bottom of the barrel was where I stood. But time went by and I met you and learned a team could consist of two. The way I was was A-OK -okay. and who cared about kids' games? Anyway, last one picked. The past is past now. Last one picked. At last 
first and not the last now A first draft choice on a winning team Like I always dreamed I'd be Imagine my surprise When out of all those other guys You picked me That song was written by Mark Waldrop and the late and really wonderful guy, Dickie Gallagher. Yeah. yeah. And it was for a musical called Howard Crabtree's whoop de doo And, oh, you were there that night. <laughs> Actually, we, we ran about nine months. And, um, but that, that comes a little later in my story. High school, it turns out for me, was kind of exciting for some other reasons. It was my junior year and I was very busy falling desperately in love with my history teacher when our drama coach, Mr. Del Monte, announced the auditions for this new thing called the Spring Musical. We did the auditions, and when he announced the results, it was a Friday morning, it was during homeroom, and he did it over the loudspeaker system. <laughs> West Arch High School proudly presents the roar of the grease paint, the smell of the crowd. And in the lead role, Alan Tulin. Stand well back, I am coming through. Nothing can stop me now. Watch out, world, I'm warning you. Nothing can stop me now. Now I know that there is a promised land. I'm gonna find it and how. Hope is high, and I'm gonna cling to it, tie every string to it, give everything to it. Well, I float down the halls on my way to my first period class, Humanities. I'm 16 years old, and it's the happiest day of my life. During the next few weeks, my skin even starts to clear up. And uh, the following year, I got to play Fagin and Oliver. I did a couple of local productions of The Fantastics, and before long, it was off to Emerson College in Boston. Now, Emerson promises, promises on the town, anyone can whistle, fiddler on the roof. And then during my junior year, we were doing a production of um, No, No, Nanette, I think. I was playing opposite my dear friend, Lisa Passero, who's here tonight. And I was also dating this skinny young kid in the chorus named um, uh, Scott Whitman. I wonder what ever happened to him. Anyway, it was, it was closing night of our three-night run, and we're in the dressing room, and all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, and, and somebody wants to see me. Well, I opened the door and was greeted by a 400-pound bald man with glasses whose name was Eric Crompold. Eric Crompold, Eric Crompold, what a beautiful, beautiful name. Well, it turns out he's a criminal attorney up in New Hampshire during the year. But in summertime, when June comes busting out all over, so does Eric. And he turns, he turns into the producer and sometimes director of the Keene Music Theater in Keene, New Hampshire. On the spot, he offers me my first professional job. The role, Barnaby Tucker. The show, Hello Dolly, out there. There's a world outside of Yonkers, way out there beyond this hick town Barnaby. There's a slick town Barnaby out there, full of shine and full of sparkle. Close your eyes and see it. Listen, Barnaby. Listen, Barnaby. Well, during the next two weeks, I fell in love with Jerry Herman and Cornelius. Well, not really Cornelius and not really in love. It was actually Paul Jackal who was playing Cornelius and I was playing with Paul Jackal when in walked a skinny kid who was gonna be the choreographer. His name was um, uh, Scott Whitman. I wonder what ever happened to him. Anyway. 
Hello Dolly was my very first Jerry Herman show. And the simple joy of playing Barnaby Tucker, who's this, this hayseed from Yonkers, who only wants to get into New York City and to kiss a girl, was fantastic. You know, I've always thought, if I could meet just one composer from the, the golden age of Broadway, it would definitely be Jerry Herman. Well, anyway. The following season in Keene, we open with Mame, starring my dear friend Susan. Terry, Sue, I think you're here. <laughs> Sue's here. And I got to play older Patrick. And in the following years, uh, there were all kinds of opportunities for me. Eric did shows like How to Succeed and Company. And even my first directing jobs, uh, Babes in Arms, Damn Yankees, Godspell. And Keene was a really fun place to be. And Eric wanted to do shows for me, but... He was producing in New Hampshire, and I wanted Broadway. And what I got when I came here was actually a show called Broadway Jukebox. Ed Linderman's Broadway Jukebox. And I, I know I saw Ed in the back, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause for my friend Ed Linderman. This was a really fun show. This was at the Sands Hotel in Atlantic City. And it was uh, an audience participation kind of a show. We actually gave the audience a list of 200 songs, and they would make their own selections. So it really kept us on our toes. But it was during the run of Broadway Jukebox that I met him. Him was almost perfect. Blonde, blue-eyed, and the almost part, married. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on him because I wasted about seven years of my life. And I know you'd like to hear about a few of my other relationships, but we only have the room booked until Tuesday. So, let me at least warmly acknowledge John, David, Ted, Leroy, Joe, George, Wally, Bob, and Father Jim. Now, there was a time in my life where the number of, of fellas that I was juggling was only, um, well, it was only, what would you say, Com you could compare it to the number of auditions that I was going to and, and the, the lack of success in both areas, well, it was kind of a challenge for me. And sometimes the easiest way for me to wrap my head around it, I mean, the only way I could really kind of make sense of it was to, to write a song about it, or at least, at least a, a parody to a, you know, an established Broadway standard. So with apologies to Frank Wildhorn and Jacqueline Hyde, after a harrowing audition, I came home and wrote not this is the moment, but my audition song, This Is My Moment. This is my ballad, this is my song, but since it's boring, you may be snoring before too long. At this audition, with your permission, I'll sing it loud and clear. It takes about a year. These are my low notes. Aren't they lush? The constipation of each vibration may cause you to flush. But I'm uplifted, just being so gifted. And modest to a fault. You may remark, give alt. This part is rangy. Hear my voice soar, and though you fidget, I can't abridge it anymore. I won't shut up, I'll never stop, I'll sing this ballad till I drop. These are my money notes, aren't they loud? I shouldn't gloat, but gee, my throat is well in when I conclude, you will always recall the longest ballad, the loudest ballad, the lamest ballad of them. Did I mention I also tap? Now, I was approaching the seven-year itch stage with him, 
when I attended my friend Nancy's wedding out in New Jersey. It was at Governor Morris. And it was summertime, so him was up in Cape Cod with his family. And it was really, the wedding left me kind of lonesome. So instead of going straight home to Brooklyn, I stopped off at a little watering hole that I knew of on the Upper East Side. It was called the Regent East. It was a piano bar. I was wearing this Glenn Plaid suit that I had gotten at Alexander's. I didn't want to waste that. And I walked in, and across the proverbial crowded room, I saw a wholesome hunk who always oh, seemed so shy. He clearly needed to meet me. Well, they don't call me the welcome wagon for nothing. Well, we talked for a little while. We chatted. It turns out he's a, he's a teacher. You know, I like teachers. And he's from a little town out in Pennsylvania called Frackville. He's from Frackville. Well, we spent five hours sitting in his Lincoln, which was in the parking lot under the newly constructed uh, Manhattan Plaza over here. And, you know, I'd always rehearsed. Re I'd heard those, those buildings referred to as Sodom and Gomorrah. And we were definitely, uh, well, regardless. Anyway, he's a sweet guy, and he called me a couple of times during the week. I didn't think anything was strange until the following Monday when I gave him a call and was greeted with a very cheerful, St. Mary's! <laughs> Needless to say, I was writing again. Why do I wake up singing? Chapel bells are ringing. I can't believe I'm dating a priest. I greeted him with a wink and on a whim. I meet him for a drink and find out he's Father Jim. I'm telling you, I was surprised to say the least. And now I think I'm dating a priest. Met him on a Sunday, said goodnight on Monday Thought it would be sweet again if he and I could meet again Well, Wednesday night from 7, we talked until 11 He said he was a teacher, he didn't say nothing about preacher So we made a date, and though I was a little late I found, to my delight, that I'd be getting in the habit If I even tried to grab it, cause there he was in black and white well, who the hell thought my heavenly host would be delivered parcel post? I can't believe I'm dating a priest! His eyes are bright and bluish. He knows that I'm not Christian. I can't believe I'm dating a priest! He's definitely got a mass appeal. He looks as though he's got a lot of... I guess I'll learn to deal with it. My love for man has not decreased. I have no fear of stating, it's clear I'm ready and waiting. Maybe I might be mating with little luck, I'll be fornicating. Christmas Eve, I believe, will be a feast. I didn't expect that someone to love me would come direct from heaven above me. I met a silent night, holy night priest. He's a beast. And that rectory had the prettiest ceiling. <laughs> oh, and planning dates was such fun. You know, we did the Cloisters and St. Patrick's. And, and Brooklyn, Brooklyn is the borough of churches, so we had a frickin' field day. But ultimately, you know, Father Jim was just another married guy to the Lord, which, you know, which is tough. But fortunately, during those times, I had backstage and show business newspaper to scour every single week looking for work. My, my attitude was if, if I could only find a job, I wouldn't have to think about my life. Been there, anybody? Anyway, Chris, how about you? Well, uh, I, I had a technique for reading those, those show business journals. I would start in the back. I would read them backwards because in the back was the late casting section. And I figured if it's late casting, they're already a little bit desperate. So that would give me an edge. So one day I see this ad, and it pops out at me, and it says, looking for talent for a midday, midtown variety show, pay. Hey. Well, I thought, you know, any variety show is going to have to have some kind of a master of ceremonies. And, and I had a great audition piece ready. And, and this is where the whole Al Tulane thing comes in. This is how I, how I got that name. A few years earlier, I had been doing a nightclub show in Cairo, Egypt. I was there for about six months, 
and it was a very splashy Las Vegas style review with six beautiful showgirls and four boy dancers, and there was a singing a pair of MCs. It was me and my friend Lorraine, and at the end of the show, I would always say, "And good night from your hosts, Alan Tulin and Lorraine Barrett." And I said to her one night, "You know, our names just sound so dull. It should be." And good night from your hosts, Al Tulane and Lainey Barrett. So from then on, we started using those names, and that's where I got this Al Tulane name. So when I went into this audition for the Midtown Midday Variety Show Pay, it was at Nola Studio up on 54th Street, and it was in Studio D, which is the one, the tiny one around on the far side of the elevator. And I go in, and um, I did something like this. More than a ripple, less than a splash, the air to a long line of glory. Give me the morning and I'll give you a song. It's so good being part of the story. Ladies and gentlemen, direct from the Caravan Nightclub at the Holiday Inn Pyramids Hotel, Mr. Al Tulane. This moment in time, this right time of day. Oh, I love being with you and watching my life at play. My love in your eyes is lighting my dreams. And the colors you choose have touches of blues and greens. This trip into time, this timeless embrace, and like a kid in a store, I'll always want more to taste. And no matter what comes, I know that sun is gonna shine. Because of you and me, there'll be this moment in time. This moment in time. This right time of day. Say it's great to be here, living it up this way. And no matter what comes, I know that sun is gonna shine. Because of you and me, there'll be this moment in time. Now, at this moment, a huge gust of wind comes in the window and blows my entire chart off the piano. But I improvise, I, keep, I, I say, keep going, keep going, we'll make it work. And the guys auditioning me are on the floor, hysterical. Finally, somebody gets me, and they hire me right away to be the MC for this Midtown Midday Variety Show pay. Now, it turns out, it turns out that the show is in the window of a stationery store at Madison and 45th, the landmark stationery store, but it was in town, and, and another adventure began. Now, it was around then that I got a call to audition for a new, a new toy that was being launched, and the toy was called Gripple, G-R-I-P-P-L-E. -P -P -E. It was, it's kind of like a flat Rubik's Cube, and um, the idea was that you had to organize these colorful, happy, little cheerful buttons, red, blue, yellow, and green, and move them around and make sense out of it. And they, they didn't know if it was a game or a puzzle, so they wanted a, a kooky, you know, <laughs> silly voice, so I did a voice like, um, it's Gripple. It's a great new puzzle. It's really a game. I mean, it's a great new game that's really a puzzle. Mine never get it right, but you can get it. Get Gripple. So, so they hire me to do these voiceover commercials. And when I went to the audition, you know, I dressed kind of cute and colorful and cheerful because I thought maybe I could somehow give them the idea that it could be more than just a voiceover. And they looked at me and they said, you know, you, you could be... Mr. Gripple. So they started doing on-camera commercials and, and events and, you know, promotions and... I have a picture. So they turned me into Mr. Gripple and I'm traveling around the country and up at FAO Schwartz and I'm doing demos and there was all this, this press all this stuff. That's, that's the gripple. I don't know if you can see it. It was a really exciting time. And I was convinced this, I thought, this, this is going to be it. This is going to be my ticket. I even, hold on one sec. I was so sure that this was going to happen 
that I made a cartoon of myself as Mr. Gripple to be ready when they launched the Saturday morning cartoon and the movie. And then everything stopped. And that ringing is the sound of me calling my managers. Ted and Libby at Landslide Management. Now, I know Ronnie Mandelbaum always laughs about that Landslide Management. I mean, talk about a natural disaster. So I, I get them on the phone. Hello, Landslide. Oh, hey, Libby, it's Alan. Hold on, dear. Landslide. Oh, hey, Ted, it's Alan. Tulin. Yeah, it seems like it's gotten kind of quiet lately, Ted. Um, have you heard anything, anything from Gripple? Hold on. Alan? Yes? Gripple is dead. <laughs> Turns out there had been a massive recall because the colorful little buttons were popping off and getting caught in children's windpipes. <laughs> And nobody cared enough to tell Mr. Gripple. <laughs> but, you know, then came um, Howard Crabtree's Whoop De Doo off Broadway, and a couple of years in Tony and Tina's wedding. And um, I used to do a TV show called In the Life. We'd, we'd say things like, coming up next on In the Life, a few minutes with the hours, the lesbian feel good movie of the year. <laughs> And, and bit by bit, the jobs that came out of the, the window in the stationery store were getting, you know, a little bit better. Usually I'd be hired to do a corporate dinner and, and I'd sing some kind of a, a greeting song. I'd be wearing this white dinner jacket and I'd, I'd do my rewritten version of Cabaret and it would always include the name of each and every attendee at the dinner. And one night in Boca Raton, something really incredible happened. The producer of the event, Ellie Lesson, said, Al, if you knew where they were sitting, could you greet them one by one? sons, Ari, are the luckiest ones. Tonight, I thank you over here. Tara Dillon's a treat, and her mom, Carol Banninger, sweet, danced and sang in 42nd Street. The best, I rank you. And here's Dahlia Haber from Brooklyn, she hails In Park Slope, the queen of all real estate sales Her business plan never fails If a co-op you're selling, she'll find you a dwelling And now, 
as I peer through the haze, I see pals from my Emerson days. Here's to you, all the girls and the gays. Suffice it to say, I finally found a way to entertain and be a star that day. So for the past 20, 25 years, the musicals and the teaching that I do up at Trinity School yeah. and that crazy yeah. act have been my career. And I love it because it's taken me to Athens and the south of France and Puerto Rico and Las Vegas. And I especially love it because on my way to one of those name song rehearsals up on 54th Street and in Tiny Studio D in NOLA, I met Carlos Alberto Becerra Luis. And now, thanks to the Supreme Court of the United States of America, he has a green card and goes by the name Husband. And, and who, who was front and center at our wedding celebration with a Tony Award on his shelf at home for the musical that he wrote with Mark Shaman, none other than that skinny kid from Boston. Oh, it was called Hairspray, maybe you've heard of it. That skinny kid from Boston, Scott Women. So, all those years ago, when that little kid sat in the balcony at the Paper Mill Playhouse, just dreaming about a life performing, oh, man, he had no idea of the, the dicey and spicy journey that awaited him. I sliced my slice of life a little thin I've been on the outside looking in It's another song from my hero, Jerry Herman and I did get to meet him It was at the box office of the Martin Beck well, now it's the Hirschfeld and I had just gotten some tickets for Kiss Me Kate and I thought the place was empty until I heard a little voice say, two for Jerry Herman, please. And there he was. And I waited for him to finish his transaction. And then I approached him and I said, excuse me, Mr. Herman, I just have to thank you for all of the joy you've given me and, and the whole world. You're Broadway. And every time I audition for Harold Hill, I never get the part, but I always sing before the parade passes by. And his face lit up and he said, he could sing that song. That song could have been written for him. And I said, I know. And, and to set up the introduction that you wrote, I always say, give me an old fashioned roll down start going into a strong march in C. <laughs> I'm gonna go and taste Saturday's high life Before the parade passes by I'm gonna get some life back into my life I'm ready to move out in front I've had enough of just passing by life With the rest of them and the best of them I can hold my head up high For I've gotta go again, I've gotta drive again I've gotta feel my heart coming alive again before the parade. Wait a minute. Look at that crowd up ahead. Listen and hear that brass harmony growing. Look at that crowd up ahead. Pardon me if my old spirit is showing. All of those lights over there seem to be telling me where I'm going. When the whistles blow, and the cymbals crash, and the sparklers light the sky. Hello? Oh, how awful! Tomain poisoning? When can I be there? Before the parade passes by. 
this would be a good time for me to say a big thank you to Sydney Meyer, who runs this place. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. To my dear friend Carol Banninger, who made this beautiful garment for me. Yeah. To your servers, Randy and Alex, no, Max, his name is Max. That's, that's something, the man of a million names can't even remember his name. But it's Max, and he was uh, working with Randy tonight. How about a round of applause for them? And my wonderful friend and musical director, Mr. Christopher Howitt. If I ruled the world, every day would be the first day of spring. Every heart would have a new song to sing. And we'd sing of the joy every morning would bring. If I ruled the world, every man would be as free as a bird. Every voice would be a voice to be heard. Take my word, we would treasure each day that occurred. My world would be a beautiful place where we could weave such wonderful dreams. My world would wear a smile on its face like the man in the moon has when the moon beams. If I ruled the world, every man would know the world was his friend. There'd be happiness that no man could end. No, my friend, not if I ruled the world. Every head would be held up high. There'd be sunshine in everyone's sky. If the day ever dawns, when I ruled the turquoise, silver, and powder blue, baby. Whoa. So when I met Jerry, I actually, it was a, around 2000, and I hadn't yet done the part of Harold Hill. I did get to do it a couple of years later, uh, in 2004, so I've, I've gotten that one off my list. But there are a, a couple of roles that are, are still on my musical theater bucket list. One of them is, is Wilbur and Hairspray Hint. But, but the other one is a beautiful role from a beautiful Jerry Herman musical called La Cage aux Faux. Do you recall that windy little beach we walked along? That afternoon in fall, that afternoon we met A fellow with a concertina sang What was the song? It's strange what we recall and out what we forget I heard la da 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 as we walked on the sand I heard la da 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 I believe it was early September Through the crash of the waves I could tell that the words were romantic Something about sharing Something about always Though the years race along I still think of our song on the sand And I still try to think of the words I can barely remember Though the time tumbles by There's one thing that I am Forever certain of 
I hear love. Da 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 da. And I'm young and in love. Thank you.